And now I am thrilled to introduce Sarah Isaun, member of the Event Horizon Telescope Collaboration and Einstein Fellow. Hello. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm really nervous. This is my first talk since before the pandemic, so in person. Um, so bear with me. Um, my name is Sarah. I'm a member of the Event Horizon Telescope Collaboration. I'm here to tell you about how we managed to make an image of a black hole. Uh, you're probably familiar with our famous image uh, from 2019. This image here, this is the image of the black hole in the galaxy M87. It's 55 million light years away from us. And I want to tell you a little bit about our journey to get to this image, what we've learned since then about this black hole, because we've had results last year that came out uh, about this black hole, and also the role that software development actually plays in big science like our project. So one thing that was really shocking when we released the image was that it actually went on front pages of newspapers around the world. This is not something that happens to science results. This is really not, people don't like to talk about science. I mean, it, it's like on page 12 or something in a newspaper, if it makes the news. But to see it on front pages the day after we made this result really made us understand that we were giving the world something special, something they could be part of. Something that shows that science is bigger than just one person. It's about collaboration, it's about teamwork, it's about overcoming differences in cultures, in countries, in career stages, uh, gender, age, etc., and actually come together for one goal and be able to, part, uh, be, able to be part of this moment. And um, this particular event, seeing it on front pages, was really a shock to us. We knew some people would be interested in this image, but we didn't know really the response that the public would have. One thing we also did not know is that the public would come up with a lot of memes. <laughs> and this was really interesting because we were trending number one on Twitter. Like, that doesn't happen to science results. Uh, so we actually understood that as a collaboration, it was our job to make sure that you're all part of our story, that you understand that you're part of science, you're part of progress, you're part of this big community that makes the world, you know, a little bit better, a little bit funnier, uh, a little bit more joyous. Hopefully I'll... Um, so I'm just a member of the collaboration. I only play a small part. We all play a small part in this big story. The Event Horizon Telescope Collaboration is 300 plus members. We're across over 60 institutes, 18 countries and regions in Europe, Asia, Africa, North and South America. We're a really diverse group of people. We're not all astronomers. There are software developers, there are computer scientists, there are engineers, there are uh, telescope operators, uh, administrators, all you know, being part of this story, all playing their important part in making this project happen. And, I only play a very small part, and I get to represent you know, all of these amazing people I get to work with today. So hopefully this plays. Um, so if you go, this is a little bit slow. Uh, if you look up at the night sky, uh, there's a constellation called the Virgo constellation. In this constellation, there's a bright dot that is the galaxy M87. This galaxy is 55 million light years away from us. That's very far. Uh, and if you look at it, it, it with optical telescopes, like the Hubble telescope, you'll see the streak of matter, of gas, that comes from it. What is that? If you actually chase this streak down, um, you look at it in the radio waves, because radio waves allow you to peer through the entire galaxy. You follow it with better and better telescopes, all the way down to its core. You find what we found with the Event Horizon Telescope, the supermassive black hole. This streak of gas is emitted by this black hole. 
This black hole is incredibly tiny compared to the size of the galaxy, and yet it creates a jet of plasma that pierces through its entire galaxy and even its galactic neighborhood. This immense power is kind of incredible, and it's something we don't quite understand. This is the most powerful process in the universe, how black holes power their jets, and we don't understand how these happen. Seeing a black hole up close with the Event Horizon Telescope allows us to make the connection between what happens near a black hole and what happens throughout its entire galaxy. So this is our goal with the EHT, understand how black holes look, how they feed, how they eject these powerful jets of matters, and how these jets also affect their nearby galaxies. So we want to see the M87 black hole. It's very far away. Um, its predicted size on the sky is about 20 to 40 microarc seconds. That's the size of about a donut on the surface of the moon, as seen from here. Uh, so telescope size is proportional to um, observing wavelength, the wavelength at which we uh, are looking with the telescope, and angular resolution of the telescope, so the size of the telescope. Um, so the angular resolution we need to see M87 is 20 microarc seconds, um, based on the predicted size. The observing wavelength we need to peer through all of the gas between us and the galaxy is one millimeter wavelength. This is the, what we call the Goldilocks wavelength, to peer through all of the gas, but that we're able to observe using Earth telescopes. And it's also in the radio, and radio waves are not bothered by anything between us and the black hole. So if we make this calculation, what is the telescope size we get to see M87? It's actually 13 million meters. Unfortunately, we tried, but no science agency wanted to fund building a telescope this big. So we ended up, we ended up with the next best thing, which is actually right below our feet, the Earth. The Earth's diameter is 13 million meters, and we can use the Earth as our telescope. So how do we do that? We use a technique called very long baseline interferometry. We find telescopes around the Earth that would form fragments of our telescope mirror, and then we synthesize a virtual telescope the size of the Earth. This is what we do. Now in order to do that, it's actually quite a challenging technique that won the Nobel Prize in the 70s in physics, uh, and I'll try to explain briefly how we do that. So we have the black hole, it emits radio waves, it's very far away. The waves that it emits arrive as plane waves on Earth, so they're flat. Now the Earth is curved. I hope you all know that. <laughs> uh, because of that, um, the t telescopes that are large distances from each other, they actually see a signal at different times. So if you look at this picture, the telescope at the bottom actually sees uh, one of the straight lines earlier than the telescope at the top. Now the Earth's curvature actually causes a problem because we need to see the signal from the black hole at the exact same time at each telescope in order to reconstruct an image. Each telescope has to see the same signal so that we can correlate the signal and make an image. Now how do we get by this problem? So we have different telescopes at different sites. The distances between each telescope is what we call the baseline distance. Each pair of telescopes gives us uh, a part of the image. So telescopes close together, they tell us about large scale structure in the image because they see more signal in common. Telescopes further apart see less signal in common and they tell us about smaller scale structure. So we need many telescopes at different distances and different orientations on the Earth to reconstruct all the information that is on the image. Then we have this time difference that we have to deal with. And this time difference needs to be taken into account. So what we use is extremely accurate clocks we, they're called um, maser clocks, and they are so accurate, they lose about a second every 100 million years. That's how accurate these clocks are. So these clocks at each telescope, they're about the size of a mini fridge. They're expensive, um, but they work. Uh, and so they, these clocks help us time tag the arrival of the signal at each telescope, and then we record that signal onto hard drives. So essentially, every piece of light that arrives at the telescope is time tagged and then frozen into hard drives. And then we play it back at a separate time later when we combine all the signals from all the telescopes, all the hard drives. So this is what very long baseline interferometry is, and this is how the EHT is made. So the uh, progress to getting the Event Horizon Telescope was a really long one. The first dishes of the EHT started in 2007, 
Uh, and then we had more and more as the years go by. Some telescopes were lost, unfortunately, they were decommissioned, uh, and uh, others joined until we reached 2017. This is the year we finally had enough telescopes, enough combinations of these different baselines that we were able to reconstruct an image. We had six different locations, six single dish telescopes, and two phase arrays. Phase arrays are basically telescopes in one place that can be combined into the same way we do with the EHT, in, into a bigger virtual telescope um, that gives us more sensitivity at that site. Uh, so we had eight telescopes um, for our observations. The South Pole Telescope did not take part in the M87 results because it's in the Southern Hemisphere and M87 is actually a Northern Hemisphere source. So the South Pole cannot see it. Now you'll notice all these telescopes look completely different from each other. The reason for that is because we didn't build them. We borrowed them. We happen to just find telescopes that can observe at the wavelength we need that happen to be at high and dry enough sites such that the atmosphere uh, and the water vapor in the atmosphere that can scramble and destroy our signal doesn't affect us as much. So these telescopes all are in the most extreme locations on the planet, the driest deserts, the highest mountains. And they were built for completely different science. They were built for standalone science. This is why they all have different designs, different looks, but they have one thing in common, actually two things in common, the clock, the mini fridge that we have, and this. Um, wait, one more thing. <laughs> I forgot I added this slide. Um, another thing is we don't observe alone with the EHT. Uh, so we've told this story that we have all these telescopes on Earth that we combine. We also observe together with other telescopes that observe at different wavelengths. So there are lots of telescopes that combined with us can teach us a lot more about the black hole. Not only do we have the black hole image, but we also know what the black hole is doing across the electromagnetic spectrum at the same time. And this is something incredible that goes beyond our collaboration because it also involves collaborating with multi-wavelength partners, with other telescopes, other collaborations to come together at this exact time and all look at the same thing. And this is really incredible. And one of the big results that came out last year uh, is this. This is what M87 looks like across the electromagnetic spectrum. So you know our famous image, which is down there. Uh, in, in yellow, there's kind of all what it looks like in the radio, where we see this jet of plasma. And then we have views of it in the X-ray, in the optical, you see the nice Hubble image, uh, which is HST here at the um, bottom one of the middle row. And then also what it looks like in the high energy and X-ray. And this view, of M87 during our 2017 campaign was really important in understanding the physics of the black hole, how it ejects this jet of matter, and how it varies with time. Now, um, as I mentioned, all our telescopes have, are completely different. They have two things in common, our mini fridge, and this um, on the right here. This is what we call our EHT backend. It's our recording equipment. Uh, this big block of things is what records our data. So we have a telescope that has a receiver on it, the receiver receives the signal, it goes through some wires, and then it gets um, down converted to a lower frequency so that we can measure it. Uh, we digitize it because we measure an analog signal, it needs to be digitized into a two-bit sampling signal, and then we record it onto our hard drives. Each of these little boxes here is called a module. Each module has about eight stacked hard drives, we recorded on 736 hard drives during our entire campaign. We recorded about three and a half petabytes of data across our entire campaign. About one petabyte of that is M87. During our campaign, uh, we observe in April of uh, each year, March, April. This is because weather is a big part of our, uh, our observing, uh, observing. As I mentioned, water vapor, atmospheric turbulence destroys our signal. So we need really good weather. And so how do we do that? Um, we try to find the best time window in which we have the most consistent, decent weather for half the planet, which is very hard to do. Uh, and during the campaign, we have a set window of days to observe, about 12 days. And we pay very close attention to the weather and technical operations with our VLBI monitor uh, to make sure we make the right decision. On each day, we make a go or no-go decision. 
And so mere hours before observing, that is when we decide to go on sky. So our operations, our telescope staff have to be you know, on it at each time and be ready to observe if we trigger. And there are multitudes of, of reasons why we trigger on certain days. Parts of it uh, also comes from our multi-wavelength partners. For example, if uh, X-ray observatories are observing at the same time, like the Chandra Observatory, uh, then uh, those are more likely days for us to observe. Um, and then, of course, the weather and op telescope operations play a major part. So in our 2017 campaign, across our 12 days, which were good five days of observation, and four of those had M87. So this is a nice picture of the 2017 observations. It's all the different uh, telescope staff and observers that were at the telescopes during the campaign. Um, you'll see everybody's happy faces. We're normally not that happy. Uh, it's high altitude and we don't sleep much. It's very tiring, uh, but we're happy for photo ops. Uh, and so in the top uh, right corner, uh, you'll notice uh, there's a woman in that picture. That's me. Uh, I was at the submillimeter telescope in Arizona during the observations. This is one of the central telescopes. So I had sometimes, you know, 30 to 35 hours without sleep. Uh, so that's fun, but it seems it was worth it. So. I think, I think we're okay. Uh, so after the observations, we pack up our modules, our hard drives, and ship them to this guy. This guy is Don Souza. Uh, he is uh, our shipping expert for the EHT. Every single package of EHT, data, equipment, goes through him. And he used to be a police officer for the state of Massachusetts, and now he's in charge of all our shipping. Uh, and he's never lost a single package uh, since um, he's, do, he's been doing this job. We had one mishap in which we thought we had South Pole Telescope hard drives, but it ended up being a bunch of silk. Uh, but, you know, everything was, was uh, solved and we got our hard drives back and the silk went back to where it belonged, uh, luckily. Uh, on the left here are our filled modules. You'll notice they have green stickers, whereas the ones in the big box I showed you had uh, they have red stickers, and the ones in the big box had green stickers. Green stickers means modules are empty. Red stickers means modules are filled. So all of these modules have our precious data. What happens to them? They get shipped half to one place and half to another. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the data reduction process of the EHT. So we measure petabytes of signal at the telescopes. Uh, part of that signal is what telescopes can see in common. So at the correlation stage, where we correlate the signal between telescopes, uh, we end up with terabytes of data. So we only keep the signal that the telescopes see in common. Then we undergo a calibration stage in which we reduce the data by um, solving for a bunch of processes and atmospheric effects that scramble our data to unscramble it so that we can average down, just like uh, constructive or destructive interference, right? If you have destructive interference, you average it down, you destroy your signal. If you have constructive interference, you can build your signal. So our goal is to have constructive interference, build signal, and uh, get higher sensitivity in our data. And this is what happens in the calibration stage, and then we're left with megabytes of data files. These data files are what are used in imaging. And then our final image is actually a few kilobytes. You can send it on your phone. And I always find this totally incredible, that from the moment we measure the signal to the kilobytes of data you can send on your phone, we undergo 12 orders of magnitude in data reduction, which is kind of amazing. And this is the process that happens in the EHT, and there isn't many experiments that go through this amount of data crunching for their final result. Now, half the data go to uh, Westford, Massachusetts, an MIT Haystack Observatory, and the other half go to Bonn, Germany, at the Max Planck Institute for Radio Astronomy. These are our correlation centers, uh, where they go onto these uh, giant supercomputers that take into account the Earth's curvature, realign the signals, and make sure that they get every combination of common signal between each pair of telescopes. So essentially, the correlators then create our virtual telescope. Then there's a long process to understand the data. So after correlation, the data go to a dedicated team that builds pipelines. These pipelines correct for the correlation errors. 
They also correct for atmospheric effects and they help build the signal, like this uh, constructive averaging. Uh, there are three pipelines that, are, that were built. One is called HOPS, one is called CASA, one is called APES. Each of these pipelines are supported by many Python packages. And again, this step is, the, is one of the most important steps of the entire process because it requires really understanding the data, separating between what comes from our instrument and the atmosphere and what is the true black hole signal. Nothing, all the science, all the analysis after that really depends on this step. And this step is Python supported. Now, then we go through a data validation by a dedicated team where we compare all these independent pipelines, their outputs, making sure that we understand uh, that we're seeing the true black hole signal. And this data validation also involves a whole bunch of uh, suites of data tests that are, again, supported by many Python packages. And this entire process was like a, a cycle of about four or five times that we did this, uh, from correlation all the way to data validation, and this took one and a half years. So if people ask, you know, why does it take so long for pictures of black holes? Uh, we observed in 2017, one and a half years was spent on this. And then about half a year later, we released the image. So it was a two-year process. And this part is incredibly important. Understanding the data is one thing. The next step is understanding of the telescopes. So we need to understand our telescopes with incredible detail, um, such as the atmosphere, how our telescopes move, how they behave. And as I mentioned, all our telescopes are different from each other. So this is not a trivial thing. It requires really paying attention and understanding each part of our instrument. And we don't really have a part that repeats. So this was quite a lot of work. Another thing we have to do is, uh, in order to make images of polarization, which I'll explain later, uh, we have to also decouple leakage. So we observe in two polarizations, and we have signal that sometimes leaks into the other. Um, because of that, unfortunately, uh, fortunately, the Earth's rotation helps us again. Uh, because the Earth rotates, the telescopes on the ground don't, don't move, but the source on the sky moves. And so by decoupling, the signal that changes over the sky compared to the one that's, that stays put, we can actually separate between what is the instrument and what is the uh, source signal. Then uh, M87 is finally ready for analysis. This is what our data looks like. As a radio astronomer, to me, this is the most beautiful figure <laughs> I've ever seen. And honestly, I like it more than the image. Uh, and not because it's Matplotlib. Uh, so, why is this so beautiful to me? Uh, if you look at the data, uh, all the different colors are different pairs of telescopes. And uh, the x-axis tells us about the baseline length. So, uh, sh short baselines sh uh, see more signal in common, long baselines see less signal in common. You'll notice we have this dashed curve on it that represents a uniform ring. So, if this was on the sky, we would see the dashed curve. And to me, that's incredibly beautiful, because a uniform ring is a beautiful mathematical concept. It has an analytic solution. It is a sync function. And it looks like this beautiful bounce. And to see this in the data, to see the data also make this beautiful bounce, actually tells us that we're seeing the, probably one of the most beautiful and simple objects in the universe, just a ring. And another interesting aspect is that at this baseline length, there are two pairs of telescopes that see different things. And uh, what this tells us um, by looking at these two pairs is that uh, there is a brightness distribution that changes. So one part of the ring is brighter than the other. And this data tells us that it's brighter on the bottom. So even without making an image, I already know what it looks like. Isn't that amazing? Just looking at this one plot, we already know it's a ring brighter on the bottom. But of course, we have a lot of questions about whether um, we're seeing what we're truly seeing. Uh, and our data are publicly available. So you can actually go and download it and download our imaging pipelines and make your own M87 image. The next step is, what is imaging? So we, again, use the Earth as our telescope. So aperture synthesis is a process where the Earth's rotation 
help us fill our virtual mirror in the middle there, and we combine data on temporal and spatial scales. So as the Earth rotates, more and more telescopes see M87. We have more and more pairs of telescopes, so the data kind of uh, form in our virtual mirror, and then we stack the data in time, and then we see how our image improves as we add more and more data. Now, how do we decide what we're looking at? So if we're looking at the data, okay, we think there's a ring in there, we think it looks a certain way, but does it really? What are, are there other combinations of, of, you know, images on the sky that could give us the same thing? So we were thinking maybe we should use, you know, machine learning or just let computers decide what we're looking at and not have a human component where, because we have such an expectation to see what we want to see that maybe we're, we're biased in that way. So it turns out people have done tests of computers uh, uh, trying to decide what they're looking at. For example, is it fried chicken or poodle? <laughs> or is it blueberry muffin or chihuahua? Or is it a sloth or a chocolate croissant? It turns out computers don't don't know the difference, uh, which is surprising because as a human, at first you might be taken aback and see if similar images, but if you take a closer look, uh, you start think, you know, uh, critical thinking and actually making up your diff the difference between these. So if you take a little bit of time, you can tell the difference. Computers can't. And so we, we just said, oh, computers struggle, so let's just have humans have a go. But we structured the imaging process in a way that tried to minimize the human bias. So this is our imaging process. So we have a data calibration stage, which I went through. Then it went through the first step, which is blind imaging in independent teams. And then we had a bunch of feedback on data quality in this process. And then it went to step two, which is pipeline building, building per independent software. Again, a lot of our pipelines are uh, supported by Python packages, in which we build synthetic models where we uh, have a truth image, and then we validate our images based on how well they fit the data, how consistent they are with other sources we observe, and how robust the structure is. So uh, in the first step, we divided the imaging group into four independent teams. Uh, two of them, teams one and two, were focused on newer uh, forward modeling techniques, and teams three and four were focused on more traditional inverse modeling techniques. Each team were asked to blindly reconstruct images and this was in order to assess human bias. So we spend a period of seven weeks in our teams not talking to the others. I was in team two, and in this process, um, we were kind of worried, because in team two, we saw a ring pretty easily. And we were thinking, what if we're the only team that saw a ring? What if only the newer techniques saw a ring? Because our team was focused on newer techniques. So what if us and team one saw a ring but teams three and four didn't. How do, we, how do we reconcile these differences? How do we end up working together if we have opposing views of what we're seeing? So in the excitement of seeing the first image of a black hole, we also had a lot of doubt and a lot of worry about what our scientific path was going forward. So seven weeks in agony. And then we met at a workshop in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and we were asked to have one image per team to show. And we all sat in this room, all quiet, and uh, Katie Bauman, who was uh, leading the comparisons of the images, she put on the screen four images. And there they were. These are the first images of M87 we saw as a collective in the collaboration. These four images from the four teams, as you can see, you know, they're a little bit rough on the edges. Uh, they were the first try, but they have huge similarities. Every image gets a ring of the same size, and every image is brighter on the bottom. So this was incredibly exciting, and it led to one of the most exciting and probably one of my favorite days in the EHT. We took a picture, we averaged all the images together, we put it on the screen, and we took a group photo. This is everybody who was there at the workshop, and there were many people also joining us remotely in the imaging teams. And you, know, you can see everybody smiling, we were so thrilled that we had finally captured the image of a black hole. And this was in July 2018, so about a year before we revealed it to the world. And uh, in that evening, of course, we went drinking. <laughs> uh, it was super fun. We went uh, to a bar, we had some drinks, we sang karaoke. You can see there in the bottom left, um, in the middle there, that's me and Katie Bauman. 
uh, and other members of the imaging team uh, blasting and singing really loud Bohemian Rhapsody, karaoke classic. And it was a lot of fun. And really, this is one of the most memorable days uh, for me as part of this project. It was incredible. So the next step is how do we convince the rest of the world that we're seeing the right thing? Uh, so we have our imaging softwares. All of these imaging softwares have knobs to tune to make a final image. And two of these softwares, the ones that were built for EHT, are on GitHub and also supported by uh, Python packages. So we decided to create uh, synthetic data, so fake data, in which we know the truth, the underlying truth image. So we wanted to pick the knobs that best reproduced all four of these images. So these were designed such that they have similar data that looks like our bounce ring pattern, but that the underlying image is not, might not be a ring. So one of them is, or two of them are rings, but two of them are not. So we tested thousands of imaging parameters systematically to decide um, which is a ring and, and or how well they, um, they reproduce all four of these data. And then the best ones that, represent, that reproduce the best images uh, were used on M87. So these were the final images by the three softwares. You'll notice that you can't tell by eye the differences. That's how well we were able to, um, to reconstruct them. And in fact, the famous image that you've seen, the first image of a black hole, is actually just the average of these three. But as I mentioned, we observed M87 for four days. And this image is only the April 11 day. So here are the other three. And these are all independent observations of the black hole. And they all give us a ring of the same size, brighter on the bottom. No significant changes are observed. And M87 is a supermassive black hole. And uh, the uh, image should change very, very slowly in this time period, which is what we see. We also have polarization images. These were released last year, about almost exactly a year ago. And these polarization images have you know, these streaks added to it that show us uh, the polarization pattern. So light around the black hole comes from electrons orbiting magnetic fields. So there's magnetic fields that thread uh, the disk that, where the black hole feeds. And then these, um, these magnetic fields have electrons gyrating in them. And then these electrons produce light uh, that is polarized, which means it oscillates in a certain direction. And what these oscillations tell us is that they can actually give us information about what the magnetic fields look like. And what the magnetic fields look like tell us about how the black hole ejects this jet. So what is a black hole? Um, so you know, uh, you all know about you know, rockets escape velocities. An object's escape velocity on Earth is independent of its mass. A rocket has the same escape velocity as a balloon uh, to, to leave Earth. And Reverend John Mitchell in 1784, he asked this question. How small does an object need to be to have an escape velocity faster than the speed of light? So how compact would you need an object to be for a rocket to need the speed of light or higher to leave its surface? And once the escape velocity exceeds the speed of light, even photons, even light, is trapped, and the star becomes dark. So this was first called the dark star. And this concept evolved into the black hole. So in 1915, Albert Einstein published his general theory of relativity. In this theory, he predicts that light is affected by gravity. So light bends around massive objects. And then in uh, 1916, Carl Schwarzschild in the trenches of World War I, he derived the first uh, non-trivial solution to this uh, equation, uh, which is the Schwarzschild black hole. It predicts a singularity uh, that depends on a certain radius, and this radius is, um, creates the event horizon in which light cannot escape. Now, a lot of you know, decades of work have been put into understanding what would black holes look like if they existed. What would it look like to an observer? What would it look like from Earth? Then in 1979, Jean-Pierre Luminet makes the first simulated image of a black hole. His simulation looks like this, which looks a lot like the interstellar image, by the way, so not so many progress you know, since 1979. Um, and his simulation was run on punch cards. You, know, you remember punch card computers? And he painted the dots of the image by hand and took the negative. 
And to me, this is just such an incredible story. You know, just the effort that went into the first simulated image of a black hole. Since then, black hole simulations have gotten a lot more complicated. We, in, uh, you know, this is all the components that go into a simulation of a black hole. We have the black hole in the center, the gas around it. Uh, we have these magnetic fields that thread them, uh, and these magnetic fields emit light and uh, also eject this uh, jet of matter. And the black hole shadow is created by the gas illuminating uh, this dark region uh, where light cannot escape. So the black hole actually lives inside this dark region. And depending on the inclination, the viewing angle that we see this black hole and the gas around it, the brightness distribution on the ring changes. So some part is brighter than the other depending on how we're looking at it. This is because if we're inclined, uh, the light that moves towards us appears boosted. They, it appears brighter than the light moving away from us. This is the Doppler effect. So then um, the light around the black hole that comes from this gas uh, gets deflected by the black hole's gravity. So if you have a lot, a lot of light rays uh, that get deflected by the black hole, uh, and then you look at it from a camera uh, far away, what you see is that um, the black hole deflects light rays further from the event horizon, uh, and it kind of puffs up into this shadow. And you have this shadow of the black hole, and then this bright ring around it. And this is the image of M87. This is what we see. Then a lot of work uh, went from our theory uh, teams at the EHT to simulate um, the black hole image. So ma make our simulation library based on lots and lots of different parameters of what it could be around the black hole. And these parameters change everything from how fast the black hole is spinning, uh, what is the gas like, what is the temperature of the gas, what are the magnetic fields, et cetera. All of these processes are you know, astrophysics related. Um, but you'll notice all of these look pretty similar. They have a dark patch in the center and a dark ring and a bright ring around it. This is because what we see in our image is the pure effect of gravity. No matter what fancy astrophysics you put around it, you will always see at the edge of a black hole what we see. Dark patch in the center, bright ring around it. Because fundamentally, what makes this happen, what is dominating the image, is gravity. Um, the polarized simulation library also looked at the uh, astrophysics of the gas. Here, actually, polarization helps us understand astrophysics in much more detail. Because while our first image dependent on gravity mostly, the polarization is not gravity related. It's related to the magnetic fields. And so our image last year taught us a whole lot more about M87 and the gas around it. Then the next step is to measure the mass of a black hole. So we had two measurements for the black hole uh, from other experiments. They differed by a factor of two. That's why we didn't know how big the black hole would be. Um, we measured this with three different techniques. I'm running out of time, so I'll just quickly go through this. So we measured it directly from the image. Uh, we also measured it using simple shapes, so just you know, make a disk, make a hole in it, move it around, and then kind of fit through all of, um, all of the different combinations of, of you know, moving these disks and blurring them, and then find the uh, size of the black hole through that, um, which you can see how it converges to the solution. Um, and then we also uh, fitted individual frames of our simulations to see which frames actually taught us about the black hole. Uh, in the EHT modeling software, we use three different software libraries to model the mass and the size. All of them Python, uh, supported by Python packages. One is an MCMC sampling uh, framework, one is a genetic algorithm, and one is, uses uh, nested sampling. Then uh, we measured uh, the mass of the black hole. So the ultimate question to life, the universe, and everything, uh, what is the size of the M87 black hole shadow? Do you know the answer to this question? 42. It's 42. <laughs> It's 42 micro arc seconds. That is the size of the M87 black hole shadow. And because the uh, size of a black hole is proportional to its mass, we could measure the mass of the black hole, which is um, six and a half billion times the mass of the sun. This is one of the most massive, supermassive black holes in our universe. 
What else, more did we learn from the M87 black hole? This is the polarization image. Uh, the polarization pattern are these kind of uh, streaks that form a spiral. The spiral polarization tells us that the magnetic fields around the black hole are also spiral shaped. And they tell us that the magnetic fields are actually strong enough and ordered enough to be able to launch the jet. And they also tell us that um, this process uses the black, hole's uh, the black hole's rotation. The black hole is spinning. And this black hole's rotation is powering the magnetic field and powering the jet. So that we learned last year. The size of M87 in perspective, so there's the sun in the center, the orbit of Pluto. Voyager 1, which is the furthest human-made object, is just reaching the edge of the shadow. That's how big M87 is. So is Einstein right? Um, that's one of the questions we always get. So Einstein predicts uh, the black hole's shadow to be fairly circular. There are other theories of gravity that predict deviations from circularity. And so we found a circularity within 10%, which means Einstein is right yet again. So what's next for the Event Horizon Telescope? Just a quick overview about where we're going. The other black hole we looked at is Sagittarius A star. It is the supermassive black hole at the center of our own Milky Way. And Sagittarius A star has these stars that orbit it, this dark region. These stars are bright in the infrared. And in fact, the orbits of these stars measured the mass of Sagittarius A star with great accuracy. So we know exactly what Einstein's theory predicts for the size of this black hole shadow because of this amazing research, which actually won the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2020. Uh, then we had, you know, we've observed it in the radio. Unfortunately, because it's in our galaxy, we have this big cloud of matter, uh, of gas, that blurs our image. So at other frequencies, we cannot see the shadow. But the EHT can. And actually, on May 12th, the Event Horizon Telescope is going to reveal groundbreaking new results about the Milky Way. So that's something to look forward to. We're also growing with the EHT. We've added new telescopes over the years at different locations. More telescopes means we fill our mirror. And we're hoping to add more and more telescopes to improve and make sharper and sharper images. Uh, another bigger project is the next generation EHT, where we want to put lots and lots of smaller telescopes at different locations in the Earth to enhance the imaging capabilities that we have. And eventually, we want to go to space, because we don't want to be limited by the Earth's atmosphere. We can go to higher observing frequencies where the atmosphere doesn't stop us. We can have a faster filling of, of our mirror with the, an orbiter going very fast around the Earth, and also have higher resolution, because we get the distances between the Earth and space. And that's you know much longer time scale. Then finally, I just want to close off by saying that really the Python community, the software developer community, open source community has been a pillar of modern science, not just for the Event Horizon Telescope, but for big science projects in general. You save us a huge amount of time <laughs> um, because all our analysis packages, everything I've presented today, all our different pipelines are a key uh, process of the scientific method. We need to cross check each other. And in order to do that, we need to look for novel ideas to do the same thing. And we need you know, variety in packages, variety in techniques. And we find that variety with you. And so big science is not possible without open source software. So this is where I end. Stay tuned for fun EHT results coming up. And thank you very much.